Well, this morning we're going to continue our journey of looking at the subject of hope. And you know, we've been talking these last couple of mornings about how Jesus offers us a real hope. And this morning we're going to look at a parable, a very, very well-known parable probably to all of you. And in that parable, it's, it's my desire, we can't uncover all that's there. It's such a rich and, and packed parable that, that we could take ten chapels to really dig into all that, that is there. But this morning, I want us to look into this parable, and I want us to see and notice really two reasons why sometimes we don't come to Jesus for hope, and why we sometimes miss out on the hope that God desires for us to live in and the desires for us to experience and know and enjoy. So if you have your Bible this morning, I want you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. Now, many of you are going to recognize this parable as the parable of the prodigal son. But I really think that that's probably not the best title for this parable. Because for whatever reason, in recent history and in our Western culture, we've sort of become very enamored with the younger brother in this parable. And his role in this parable is not insignificant. In fact, it's very significant. But the parable is not about one son. It's about two sons. So let's, for the sake of unity this morning, let's call it the parable of the two sons. All right, the parable of the two sons. So if you have your Bible, Luke chapter 15, and let's just begin with verse 11. It says, there was a man who had two sons. And we're going to see this morning that these two sons are very different. How many of you have a sibling that's nothing like you? All right. How many of you sometimes wonder where did they come from, right? All right. Are they re do we really share the same DNA? And, and can this really be real? Right? Sometimes we're so different than our siblings. You know, growing up, I have an, uh, a sister who's 18 months older than me. Uh, she came here as a camper. In fact, she's why I came. Uh, she uh, plays the viola, a very talented. And uh, she was smart and talented and one year ahead of me in school. And so I would, uh, you know, have the same teachers sometimes as she did. And they were like, oh, you're Amy's brother. And then by the end of the year, they're like, oh, you're Amy's brother. Right? I wasn't anything like her. And sometimes we are so different than our siblings, and we're going to see that this morning, this great contrast in, in these siblings. I want us to back up for a moment and look at verses 1 and 2, if you have your Bible, in Luke chapter 15, because we just need a little bit of context this morning about the scene in which this parable was taught and heard. And so in, in verses 1 and 2 of, of Luke 15, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners... We're all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. People who knew nothing about God, people who were far from God, were attracted to Jesus and his message. They heard the things that he was saying, and they were hungry for what he had to offer. But in an odd way, the people who knew the, the scriptures, the Old Testament, the most, the people who were most committed to obeying and following the scriptures, sometimes had a really, really hard time with Jesus' message. And we can see here and in other places in the New Testament, they really hated, they really hated that Jesus hung out with people that weren't like them. And people who in their minds were not deserving of Jesus' time. And so you see there in the text, tax collectors, the most hated people in society because they were sellouts and traitors. They were Jews who worked for the Roman government to collect their taxes and then extorted not just the taxes but more money to become wealthy themselves. And sinners in their mind, people far from God. And they gathered to hear Jesus and they said, not only does he welcome them, but he eats with them, right? A meal, sharing a meal together is a very significant thing in this culture. In fact, it still is today, right? There's something powerful about sharing a meal together. And so they were very, very upset. And so Jesus, knowing this, he shares a couple of, actually three parables, three stories. The first two were about finding or seeking that which is lost, right? The lost sheep and the lost coin. And, and many people in the crowd probably resonated with and understood and even agreed or, or were, were glad to hear those parables. But then Jesus shares one that's going to cut very deeply into his audience. 
And Jesus does this sometimes because he wants to get to the issues of our heart. So let's continue and look at this parable by going back to verse 12 and continuing on this journey. And first we're going to consider the younger son and then the older son. So verse 12 says, The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property with them. Many of you are familiar with this story, but basically the son is saying to his dad, he says, Dad, I want out. Right? I, I, it's like he's saying, Dad, I wish you were dead and we were receiving our inheritance. Dad, I don't care about you. I don't love you. I don't want to be here anymore. I just want what's mine. I want my piece of the estate and I want out. Now, as a parent, I can't imagine, can't imagine what it would have been like to hear that. Dad, I, w I don't care about you. I want to get out of here. I, I wish you were I went, I'm ready to go out and do my own thing. And amazingly, the dad grants his request. And this was a, a big thing because this wouldn't have just been, you know, going to the ATM and, and withdrawing his portion of the cash and handing it over. This wouldn't have just been writing a, a check, right? This would have been probably selling property, right? Dividing the estate. This was a big thing. And he would have been entitled to one-third. How many of you are the oldest son in your family? All right, you would have gotten two-thirds. All right? There's perks to being the oldest sometimes. And so he demands his dad's inheritance. And the father grants the request. He didn't say anything. It doesn't say that he said anything. And so this happens in verse 13. It says, Not long after that, the younger son gathered all that he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild or prodigal, extravagant, over-the-top living. And so the younger son heads off for what he thinks is going to provide him freedom and fun and joy and probably hope. Right? He thinks that getting to do what he wishes, that getting what he wants is going to fulfill him. And I would probably guess that you have thought something similar before. How many of you thought, if I could just get my way, I'd be happier? All right, come on, right? right? We all sometimes think that if I could just get my way, if I could do what I want, my parents weren't telling me what to do all the time, right? If I could just be out on my own, I could be happier. And so he goes out and he experiences all that there is to do. He, you know, lives an extravagant life, no doubt. It involved women and alcohol and partying and all the things that he thought would bring him pleasure and excitement and happiness and hope. But then, it doesn't take long, the Bible says, before he wasted all of it. That he spent it all. And it was gone. The cash was gone. The credit cards were maxed out. Are you with me? And not only that, but we're going to see that a famine hits. And so look at verse 14. It says, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. He ends up in such a desperate place that the only thing he can find to do, there's a famine, food is scarce, he's got no money, and so he gets a job feeding pigs, right? And for, for a Jewish man to be feeding pigs, right, is pretty ironic, right? Pork was not something that they were allowed to eat. It was against their law. Aren't you thankful for the new covenant, right? <laughs> Amen. Bacon, are you with me? Yeah. All right. And so it's very ironic that he's there feeding pigs. It's really a picture that life has gotten hopeless for this man. Right? He, he is in a hopeless situation. He's spent all his money. He's burned his bridges with his family. Right? I, I mean, there, there's nowhere for him to turn. There's nothing for him to do. And maybe, maybe you can identify this morning. Now, my guess is that none of you have went to your dad and asked him to divide the estate. Can we, is that a safe assumption? Can you all nod? Right? I hope none of you have done that. So we're not talking about identifying in that way, but maybe you can identify because you can say, you know what, I've had the notion, right? I've had that thought that, that hope and freedom is found in doing what I want. That it's getting my way. That, that hope is found in rebelling, not just against my parents, but it's, a, it's found in rebelling against God. That God's ways are restrictive. God's ways are, are holding me back. And I'm, I'm going to do what I want. 
Maybe you can identify with the dead end that that has left you at, or maybe, maybe you haven't gotten there yet. You know, sometimes we have to hit bottom. We have to hit bottom before we realize we're going the wrong direction. And that's what's happened to this younger son. He's hitting bottom. He, he, he realizes, I, I'm, I'm at the bottom. Now, can you imagine for a moment the listeners, the hearers of this parable? How many of you think there's a lot of nodding heads in the crowd? Think, picture the Pharisees for a moment, right? These religious leaders who feel that they are morally superior to the other people in the crowd that are there with them. Right? Are you with me? Are you awake? And they're hearing this. And they're, they're hearing about this, this, this son who, who demanded his dad's inheritance and he went out and he wasted it. And now he's feeding pigs. And I bet you there were some amens in the crowd. There were nodding heads. Serves him right. What a wasteful young man. I bet you there were even some whispers about karma, right? Serves him right. That's what he had coming. The prodigal is in a bad place. His days as his dad's son are over. Right? He's, he's burnt that bridge. He's got nothing. And so in verse 17 it says this. When he came to his senses, he said... Man, this is crazy. What am I doing here? He says, how many of my fathered hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me like one of your hired servants. So he hatches out a plan. He says, this, this feeding pigs is, and I, I mean, I'm starving. I, I want to eat what they're eating and I can't even eat what they're eating. I couldn't even digest it. I... I my dad, maybe, maybe if I do this really well, maybe if I go back and really rehearse this well. Dad, uh, you know, I, I, I've sinned. I, I've been terrible. I, I know I can't be your son anymore, but can I work for you? Right? Can I live in the workers' quarters? Can I, can I work here on your estate? Because then at least I'll have a place to sleep. So he's hatched out a plan to go to the Father. So let's see how this goes. Verse 20. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine who was dead and now is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And so they began to celebrate. Now how many of you, I know you've heard this before, but if you were hearing this for the first time, how many of you would say, that was unexpected, right? Right? Like, you can imagine the original hearers of this parable. They were like, what? The father did what? I'd have whipped that boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, are you with me? I'd have said, forget it. But instead, we see this beautiful and amazing picture of God's response to sinful people. Right? Here you see the father looking and waiting for the son. I bet you he went out to that hill every day and waited for his son. I bet you every day he went out there and looked and hoped that maybe this day my son will come home. He prayed and desired for his son to come home. And then we see something that a, a, a man in this culture of his stature would never ever do in public, which was to run. But he runs to his son. He doesn't even wait for him to get to him. And he doesn't wait for him to say anything. He throws his arms around him in his filthy, dirty condition. And lavishes his love and his mercy and his grace on him. And then his son still tries to go through the speech, right? You know, how many times, like, you, you've, you've got something, I've got, I'm just going to get it out, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. And he's, he's like, Dad, I'm not worth it. And he's like, I can just, his dad be like, shh, 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 no. He says, bring the robe. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. These were all symbols and signs of, that he was going to restore him as his son. The robe was for honored guests. The ring symboled authority. The sandals were something that only a son would wear, not a slave, not a servant. 
The father was determined to restore his son. And of course, this is a picture of God's love for us. Right? God's willingness to receive us. God's desire to meet us in our mess and offer us restoration and offer us hope for our rebellion. You see, the younger son was all about rebellion. But when he came home, right, the father was ready to receive him and to restore him. He said, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and the best robe. It's not the best picture of it, maybe, but I think it's a beautiful picture of what God did for this man. What does it mean? It means that God's grace can restore anyone. God's grace can restore anyone. You're never so far gone. You've never rebelled so far away that God's grace cannot restore you and restore hope to you. And, and it might be today that, that rebellion is what's keeping you from hope. The reason that you're not living in the hope that God desires for you to have and experience is because you're rebelling against Him. You're running away from Him. You're running as far as you can from Him. Maybe not on the outside, but maybe on the inside. Maybe not you know, in, in your actions, maybe yes. But in your heart, you are rebelling against God. And I want you to know that the Father is waiting for you. Waiting to embrace you, waiting to restore you, waiting to give and lavish His grace on you. Now we might think, certainly, this is the climax of the story, right? Like this is it. I mean, could you write a better story than this? Could you tell a better parable? This has got to be the, the climax of the story. The, the rebellious son has come home and the father has lavished his grace on him. He, he's put a ring on his finger and a robe on him and sandals on his feet. And then he says, kill the fatted calf. Right? This, this was the most expensive meal that you could have. The fatted calf was reserved for, for the most special and glorious of occasions. The whole neighborhood would be invited right? and a party would happen. Right, and so the father says, go kill the fatted calf. We're going to party. We're going to celebrate. My son who was lost has come home. The message could not have been more clear to the audience. That sinners were welcome to come to God. That people who were far from him were welcome to come to him and experience his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy and his freedom. But the Pharisees could not understand that. Because they had a different way of seeking hope. You see, the, the younger son thought hope is found in rebellion, but the older son, he thinks hope is found in religion, in keeping the rules. Look at verse 25. We would completely miss the meaning of this parable if we can, did not consider the older brother. It says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what it was going on. Oh, he says, your brother has come home. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has come back safe and sound. How many of you think the older brother is like, oh, good, my brother's home. Oh, and we're having fatted calf for dinner. Let me go clean up and get into the house and party with them. How many of you think that's what happened? All right, most of you have read the story. Wouldn't it be great if that's what happened? Wouldn't it be great if the older brother said, wow, my brother's come home and I want to celebrate with him and I want to rejoice. But the problem was he was just as rebellious as his older brother, just in a different way. While he had faithfully and dutifully served his father, he hadn't done it out of love for his father. He hadn't done it out of love and compassion. He had done it out of duty. And so look at verse 28. It says, The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father and said, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never, never disobeyed your orders. I don't know if he was telling the truth or not, but he certainly had a high opinion of himself. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Man, you're giving him the fatted calf and I didn't even get a goat. But this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home and you kill a fatted calf for him? The father said, my son, my son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead 
and is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. We see a couple of things here. The, the, older, the older brother's angry, right? Because this is, I mean, this is going to cause, like, if he's back in the family, he's like, does that mean we have to redivide the inheritance? Like, I'm going to get even less now. Like he wasted all of his, now he's going to probably get more. And you kill the fatted calf for him. You're, you're doing all this. I, I, I deserve this. I've kept the rules. I've been obedient. I've worked hard. I deserve this. And this part of the parable was intentionally focused with laser precision at the Pharisees and the religious leaders who thought they were superior and better than everyone else. It was intentionally designed to confront their pride and their confidence in their religious performance to earn God's hope and to earn his favor and to earn his approval. But you see, the older son, the older brother was just of a need of the father as was the younger brother. And we see also, not, not only was the older brother angry and, 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 and not even willing to call his brothers, he, he says to his dad, this son of yours, right? And I like how the father says, this brother of yours, right? But the father, look at what the, what, what does the father do? He goes out to his older son and he pleads with him, right? We see the father's love and compassion, not just for the rebellious younger son, but also for the religious older son. He says, won't you come into the party? Come on in. We've got fatted calf. We've got the best band. We've got dancing, and let's, let's party. Your brother's home. I welcome and receive sinners. And the parable just ends. It just ends. We don't know. We don't know if the brother said, no thanks, Dad. We don't know if he came in. And why is that? Because the answer was hanging in the balance with these hearers of this parable. Jesus ends the parable because it's now he's saying, it's, it's your move. Right, this is your, your opportunity to respond to the truth that I've presented you today. Are you going to understand my heart? Are you going to understand my desires? Are you going to understand what I've done? And are you going to accept it and receive it for yourself or not? Here's the thing. You can't earn hope. You can't earn hope. You can't go find it Right through rebellion against God. It's not found in seeking things outside of God. It's not found in performance. Right? You, you can't just do X, Y, Z. I, I've, I've checked off the list. Right? And, and now God has to give me hope. No, that's not how it works. You can't earn it. There is a story uh, that's told. And it's, it's really what we call an apocryphal story. It's a story that comes out of uh, tradition, but it's not a biblical story, so we don't know this is true. In fact, it may, may very well not be true. But it sort of illustrates this point. And Tim Keller shares this book in his book, Prodigal God. And it says that the story went something like this, that Jesus one day asked all of his disciples to carry a stone. Just as, I want you to carry a stone for me. And so they all picked up stones, and Peter he started thinking about this and he thought Jesus didn't say what size stone to pick up. So he says, I'm going to find me a very small stone. Right? You with me? Sounds smart. So they walk all morning. Some of them are carrying pretty big stones and Peter's got his little stone thinking, ha, you guys are crazy for carrying big stones. Then they stop for lunch and Jesus turns all the stones into bread. And that was your portion for lunch. Now Peter's like, ah! So after lunch, Jesus says, hey guys, I want you to pick up a stone and we're going to walk some more. And Peter's like, I got it this time, right? And he finds the biggest stone he can carry and he hauls it all day and he's tired and his arms are burning and his back is aching. But he knows, man, I'm going to eat well, right, for dinner tonight. And then they, they arrive at a place near a riverbank and Jesus says, all right guys, throw your stones in the water. And Peter's like, what? And Jesus says, who were you carrying the stone for? Right? Who were you carrying the stone for? Were you carrying it for me, like I asked you to? Or were you carrying it for you? You see, the older brother wasn't serving the father because he loved him. The older brother was serving the father for what he could get out of him. For what he thought he deserved. 
And we have to come to a realization in life that we don't deserve God's grace, that we don't deserve His mercy, that we don't deserve His love, that we don't deserve His hope, but that He is willing, He is willing to graciously give it to us when we come to the end of ourselves. And maybe today, for you, you've never really come to that place where you've come to God and said, I, I, I am at the end of myself and I am rebellious against you. And I need your grace and I need your forgiveness. I want to place my faith in the Jesus who loved me, who lived for me, who died for me, who rose from the dead for me, who reigns and who's coming back. You can't earn hope, but you can receive it. And so I just want to ask you this morning, are you trying rebellion? Right? Are you trying rebellion? And if you'd say, if I'm honest in my heart, I'm kind of on the run this morning. I believe God's brought you here to this place, right? He's brought you here to this place because He wants you to know that He's waiting for you to come home. And He's waiting to lavish His grace and His mercy and His hope on you. But you have to come to the end of yourself. And then when you do, you'll find the Father waiting, waiting to embrace you, waiting to forgive you, waiting to party with you, to celebrate. But maybe... Maybe you say, no, it's, for me it's religion. Now I'm not talking about true and genuine religion that the Bible talks about, which is faith in Jesus. And our, I'm talking about religious effort apart from grace. Right? Our trying to earn it. And our thinking that we can serve God to get something from God. Right? You can't do that. I, I tell people all the time, you can't put God in a headlock. Right? You can't force God into doing what you want Him to do by your behavior. Don't let rebellion or religion keep you from hope. Right, there's two amazing pictures this morning. Both of these men missed it. But one, one received what he needed. The other had an opportunity. But more than likely, he passed it by. Don't let your opportunity pass you by. Would you bow your heads this morning? And just uh, in a moment of reflection, I just want you to ask yourself, God, what is it that, that, that you're wanting to speak into my life today? F F Father, what is it that, that you want me to hear? And what is it that you want me to do based on that? It, it's my desire for all of you that you would know and live in and experience the incredible hope that God offers you. But if you're living in rebellion or you're living in religion, you're never going to experience this hope. But the Father is waiting for you. The Father is waiting for you. He's waiting for you to come to Him and to bow at His feet and experience His grace and His mercy and His warmth and His embrace and His hope. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, Father, I thank you that you are a God who offers extravagant grace, that you offer mercy and unending supply. And Father, I pray this morning that, that, that every single one of us would realize our great need of running to you. And Father, I thank you that when we come to you, we realize you were already coming to us. And Father, I thank you that there's nothing, nothing in our past that can stop you from loving us. Father, I thank you that there's nothing that we've done that you can't and won't forgive. Father, I thank you there's nothing in our past that can keep us from having hope. And Father, I pray that you would help everyone to know that no matter what's in their past, no matter what they've done, that you offer them a living hope. And Father, I pray for the one that may be trying to keep all the rules. Father, may they realize they have just the same need of your grace and your mercy. And may we experience your living hope today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.